Well, welcome everybody. Um, we'll start just very shortly. Let me draw your attention to our poll. Uh, as I just mentioned, we do have a running a poll um, over the opening 20 minutes or so of the um, of the event, of the, of the webinar, and um, uh, do answer those questions. We'll be coming to the uh, coming to the um, coming to the results later on. Okay, uh, let's get cracking. Um, I mentioned others will join us um, as we go. Um, Welcome to this uh, Innovation Forum webinar. I'm Ian Welsh. I'll be your host for the next hour or so. Today, in the latest of our big debate series, we're going to be considering the European Union's deforestation regulation. The EUDR has been designed, of course, to prevent deforestation-linked commodities and products from entering the EU market, and in doing so, catalyze a much-needed reduction in deforestation on a global scale. With the regulation coming into full effect uh, at the end of this year, some have raised concerns that smallholder farmers who supply a significant share of targeted commodities will lack both the technical and financial means to comply. With fears that businesses may choose to remove smallholders from EU supply chains under current rules, millions of farmer livelihoods could be left extremely vulnerable. This is a big issue for sure at, at Innovation, Innovation Forum's Sustainable Commodities and Landscapes Conference in October last year, EUDR was without question the number one topic of debate. There's lots to talk about. And to help frame our discussion today, I'm delighted to be joined by a fantastic expert panel. We have Emmanuel Pito, International Relations Officer, the DG Environment at the European Commission. We have Olivier Tichet, Director for Sustainability at Muse Mass, and Tessa Mulstein, Senior Program Manager for Coffee at IDH. Welcome to you all. I'll turn to our panel shortly, but we want to hear from you. Please be thinking about points and questions that you'd like me to put to the panel and write them in the Q&A box on your Zoom window. Um, I would really welcome if everyone would use their name when they're making questions. Um, we're all we're all here with our names and we're all talking on the record. So please, if you're going to put a question, put your name. I will tend not to use anonymous questions. I'd rather everybody has their name uh, when they're putting in their question. Uh, we are recording the session as well, uh, and we'll share the recordings with uh, all uh, registrants uh, after the panel. When you're uh, looking at the Q&A, of course, you can uh, like others' questions. The more likes a question gets, the greater the chances that I will put that question to the panel. Okay, let's get cracking. Manuel, welcome. Perhaps you can start us by outlining what the uh, EUDR is and what it is it is designed to achieve, Manuel. Thank you, Jan, and thank you very much for for the invitation. Uh, first of all, uh, and I think it's a pleasure to talk about this uh, this uh, regulation, especially now that we are at a critical juncture. As you say, the regulation. Uh, will uh, enter into application uh, at the end of this year. It was presented in 2021, adopted in 2022, entered into force in 20, last year. So we are really at a, at a, at a crossroad uh, when it comes to this uh, uh, specific regulation. Uh, now, I will, uh, as you asked me, I will perhaps uh, uh, say a few words on the policy rationale uh, about of this regulation. Even this may sound... Uh, as a truism, of course, uh, this re regulation finds it rational in the fact that uh, fighting deforestation uh, uh, is key to achieve our uh, climate change and biodiversity uh, goals. So this, unless we uh, deforestation is uh, addressed, uh, deforestation and forest degradation we would be un is, uh, is properly addressed, effectively addressed worldwide, uh, we would be unlikely to meet biodiversity and climate change goals. Uh, of course, there have been uh, over the years a number of commitments worldwide, including sustainable development goals, most recently Glasgow Declaration, uh, uh, where countries worldwide had, had committed to uh, alter and reverse deforestation, but un unluckily this didn't, didn't lead to uh, promising results. So uh, th this, uh, this regulation uh, also uh, finds its, its, its rationale in two in twofold evidence, I would say, scientific evidence. First of all, uh, the fact that deforestation takes place worldwide, uh, uh, both illegally, but also uh, actually in line or in compliance with uh, the legislation of the country where it takes place. So deforestation worldwide is both legal and illegal uh, and the second evidence is uh, is that deforestation uh, is linked to 
in the majority of cases is, is linked to the conversion of land for the purpose of agricultural use. So conversion of land from forest into agricultural use for the production of a specific set of commodity associated with the forestation. So uh, against this background, uh, against this background, the uh, European Union, as because the European Union is a large consumer of these commodities, uh, uh, it was uh, just uh, obvious that we would take action uh, to minimize EU contribution uh, to deforestation and forest degradation uh, worldwide. So, and this is actually the objective of this regulation, which we would. It, it's important to, to keep in mind. The objective is to minimize EU contribution to deforestation and forest degradation worldwide. An objective that has two corollaries. First of all, to minimize the risk that products from supply chains associated with deforestation are actually placed on the EU market or exported from it. And the other side of the coin is that uh, the specific objective is to increase EU demand for and trade in legal and deforestation-free commodities and products. Uh, now, uh, I think this is this is the policy rationale why uh, and and the objective of this why this regulation and what is its its objective. Its feature again uh, maybe are well known, but this regulation establishes a set of obligations for operator, meaning those placing on the market on the EU market. Uh, a specific set of commodities, regardless whether they are EU produced in the EU or imported uh, or exported from the EU. So it, this regulation applies in this, irrespective of whether we are talking about domestic or imported products. Uh, an obligation of uh, for operators placing on the market uh, these these uh, set of commodities, and these obligations are due diligence obligations uh, to prove actually that uh, the the commodity or the derived product are legal and deforestation free. Most typically, the deforestation free requirement will be proved through the provision of uh, geolocation, meaning where the specific commodities has been uh, produced. Uh, I, I am aware that this is a super uh, short uh, resume of what the regulation is and what it's trying to achieve. Of course, we are, as I said, in, at a critical juncture because there are a number of uh, uh, aspects of this regulation that, uh, I mean, not all aspects of implementation lend themselves to uh, uh, the, the legal text to um, bring clarity. So the, the legal test that does not uh, shed clarity on all aspects of, uh, of, of the practical implementation. So we are working um, uh, as we move forward full implementation to, uh, to dispel ambiguities and to clarify aspects of implementation, but also to listen to uh, uh, concerns and, and this this uh, and this forum is of course is an excellent opportunity for this uh, for this. I will stop here and of course I will be happy to to take uh, questions and to discuss with you. Thank you. That's great. Well, thanks very much indeed. Perhaps you could just outline what's the timetable then from this point. Um, the regulation has come into effect, but its full impact is until the end of the year. Just perhaps just talk us through the different time, you know, the different signposts along the, 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 the time timetable. The regulation was uh, entered into force on the 30th of June 2023. However, the obligations for uh, for operators, so those who have to uh, comply with the obligation to to prove that a specific commodities, specific commodity or products in scope is deforestation free and legal, uh, these obligations will start applying as of uh, as of thirtieth uh, of December twenty twenty four. But the regulation is already in force. Uh, for example, member the, the obligation of uh, member states to appoint a competent authority, because I forgot to mention that the, the enforcement of this regulation lies with member states, EU member states competent authorities. The obligation for member states to appoint such competent authority uh, was um, the, the end of last year. So we... we uh, we should have right now already already the the competent authorities, but the obligations for those placing on the market commodities and products will start being ap applicable as of next year, basically as of 
2025 onwards. From that moment onwards, ob uh, operators will have to submit uh, due diligence statements proving that uh, a specific commodity or a product in scope is legal and deforestation free. And from that moment, they will have to comply with due diligence obligations. Can you just remind us the commodities that we're talking about? We are talking about seven commodities, uh, which is coffee, uh, cocoa, palm oil, timber, uh, rubber, and cattle. If <laughs> I always forget one. Uh, and a list of derived products which are uh, used, which are made using these commodities. The list of derived products, uh, typically uh, furniture for timber, uh, tires for rubber, uh, chocolate for cocoa, is included in Annex 1 of the regulation. So we have a list of HS code, uh, customs code, which pinpoint exactly which derived product are in scope. Yeah, I think soy is also on the list, isn't it? I think that was- Soy, it... yes. Yeah. I, I always forget one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And just final final question uh, for now. The What are the um, sanctions that uh, will come in uh, on the 30th of December? Well, uh, the sanctions uh, and the penalties are in the remit of, uh, of member states. So, and this is member states, uh, you member states are very jealous about this prerogative. So we, we had uh, established, uh, uh, I mean, penalties have to be dissuasive, proportionate, proportional and effective. Uh, it's up for member states to achieve this. One of the, maybe I forgot to mention one element, this regulation, of course, is supposed to repeal and replace a previous regulation which was focusing only on timber and which was focusing only on illegal timber, uh, which is this was the timber regulation. Now, uh, one of the evidence uh, of the evaluation of this timber regulation was that there was a, a broad discrepancy in the level of penalties in the U27. So one of the lessons learned was uh, to, uh, and I think we have achieved this, to have a, 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 a more uh, a, a more harmonious set of penalties for uh, operators and traders that would be in breach of this regulation. But the typology of penalties, of sanctions, is within the remit of member states. It can be administrative sanctions or even criminal sanctions in the most serious uh, 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 case of breaches. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much indeed for, for a comprehensive outline of, of, of the regulation and, and other implications. Thanks also everyone for your questions. We've got loads of them already. Uh, do use the upvote function. I will be going for the questions that have got the most upvotes, most uh, the most popular, um, but please keep them coming and we'll get, turn to them shortly. Uh, Olivier, welcome. Mr. Uh, Mass, one of the biggest palm oil businesses in the world. Obviously palm oil is within scope of the UDR. Um, Perhaps, Livy, reflect a little bit on what you've heard from Emmanuel, but I'd be keen to hear from you what the challenges are that you're finding in terms of how EUDR will be implemented. I mean, I would imagine that the law of unintended consequences will be firmly in play. Livy. Thank you, Ian, and uh, thanks for having us uh, in, this, in this panel. Very hot topic, as you mentioned, indeed. Uh, Amsterdam was amazing that uh, you would say anything and you would go back to UDR. So I'd like to speak from the, the point of view from a business based in Indonesia in that case and uh, depending quite greatly on small farmers. So I'll focus on small farmers otherwise the, the, the list of issues with the UDR would be a bit too long and not exactly fair I think. Or not, not very nice to do. Three requirements for the UDR to summarize seen from a business point of view. Three, three requirements. Indeed the products have to be deforestation free. They have to be legally produced but also they have to be segregated all the way. So you have to make sure that these products never get in touch with other products, even the same kind of products. All three are very strict requirements as set by the regulation. There is no tolerance. There's a tiny tolerance on uh, the deforestation per declaration. It's half a hectare, which is per year 500, 500 kilograms of coffee per, per shipment or per declaration, if you wish, to take the example of coffee, uh, or 700 kilograms of rubber. Um, the sanctions, I, I don't know, I, I must have misread because I read in the, in the regulation that the sanctions were 
could be financial sanctions at, at a minimum of 4% of the EU uh, turnaround, turnover sorry, of a company. So I, maybe something we can clarify a bit later. Um, the issue that we have is the main issue that we have at the moment is that we have, for example, for deforestation, we have no official reference map for due diligence. It will be left to the, uh, to the member states or it will be left to us, which is fine with me. Um, we have also for legality, the guidance is as per local law, which is fair, but at the same time does not reflect. And I, that's why I'm surprised that the EU would say that because it doesn't reflect the actual knowledge that the EU should have of the situation in particular of small farmers who are in a, most of the time in a non-formal economy where also they might not have land titles, even though the law of the land should be that you have land titles if you're a farmer. And segregation, well, it's very simple to understand. It's very strict. You cannot mix from beginning to end. Fair enough, but it's very demanding. Now, the real issue on the other issue that we have that will that we condition what I'll say afterwards is that the checks will start in 2026. Time being by the uh, by the, the national competent authorities, and which means that what we are preparing today and the shipments that we'll do in 2025 will be, I'm not going to say blind, but effectively we will not be checked and we will not have an idea of how we're going to be checked, except if suddenly the national authorities start issuing guidelines tomorrow or very soon, because we need to know that by by now, basically, it would be nice. It's not as if we, we make things today for shipment tomorrow. It's not as if we can get our suppliers or farmers to comply or ready for compliance or identify the ones who can comply today for tomorrow. And so this means that we are going to be very careful in, the, in this first year and a half. We are going to have um, to be very, very conservative in the approach that, uh, that we take. So for smallholders, what's it going to mean for us? Uh, how are we going to look at our supply base and, and look at, at, in particular, small farmers? Uh, legally produced. Well, that means for Indonesia, we are not going to be able to accept independent smallholders who have no land titles. My problem is that, in theory, it's fine. Let's say there's 100 smallholders. I'll pick the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 who do not have land titles, and we'll segregate them. Well, that's not that simple. Um, it's, it's, uh, they might not have deforested for that matter, but I will have to exclude them because I cannot demonstrate positively that they are legal, that they have a land title, uh, which is a bit of a problem. Um, there's also the issue of the date of production, but maybe I don't want to bore people with uh, the point about date of production and, and the, the, how we're going to pass that down the, the line. If you look at coffee, for example, uh, coffee farmers and coffee independent smallholders, cooperatives. I, I'm sure Tessa will speak about that better than me, but they will hold their, I used to work in coffee. So they will hold their stocks to wait to sell at a better moment. So if they have also to keep track of the exact dates of production and make sure that they pass on that information accurately, otherwise they'd be disqualified to ship to the European market, that's going to be a bit cumbersome. And to be frank, I don't see what it achieves, but never mind. But that is playing once again against smallholders as they are today for their vast majority. Also, finally, that smallholders can be present in multiple supply chains. So it's quite difficult to, to, to attach them to one specific supply chain and tell them, well, from now on, you will be in this supply chain and won't get out because it's really difficult to identify you to demonstrate your compliance with EU requirements. And now don't get out of there. How, how do we block them in that kind of situation? I think that's, that's not going to happen very well. So how, but we were talking about how do we kind of address or bring solutions? Um, there's a mention of negligible risk in the in the regulation. I know it's been explained in, a, in the, the FAQ is a bit particular about it, but I think we could use negligible risk to the benefit of small farmers and to ensure their inclusivity. Why do I say that? Because we have been developing tools on how, how do we address the mass of smallholders. In Indonesia, there's 2.6 million pound smallholders. How do we assess what's in our supply chain, knowing that they go in of the supply base of a mill to the other, to another mill tomorrow, and so on and so forth? We have already conservative, quite precise tools on how we can assess without going individually to each smallholder if they are legal and if, or at least if they are not illegal and if they are deforested by using things that I think the EU is looking into geolocation in excess, de declaration in excess. Um, but we'll go a bit further. That's, I think, where there is a clash. We'll go at village base, uh, geolocation and traceability, whereas the EU is asking precise farm points, where I think that's that's where the, the good is the enemy of the, 
Oh, sorry, the better is the enemy of the good, I think is the right um, expression. And uh, maybe I'll stop there. I think I've been long enough. Thanks. Livy, when we spoke in October, um, Moose & Mass had just announced that they were likely to not have some older farmers in their supply chain for the European Union. Have any of the things that you've mentioned just now changed that uh, that policy? No, no, no. As, as of today, we are still in the same situation where our priority will be not to include smallholders. Uh, we have, there will be a minority, a very small minority of smallholders. We know we can include because they are the ones supplying directly to our own meals. There are some supplying to some of our suppliers' meals who are also very well documented. For the others, most of the time, we the tools we have designed to ensure that we can assess their legality and their or their lack of illegality and their performance in terms of deforestation, that will not be enough to satisfy the EU. It's been enough to satisfy a lot of our customers and NGOs, but not, not the way the EU regulation is written and explained uh, at the moment. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, obviously, massive implications of, of, of that, potentially. Uh, Emmanuel, can I turn back to you very quickly uh, on Olivier's point? He said that as far as he was concerned, uh, the sanctions for breach of the regulations will be a minimum of 4% of EU turnover. Is that the case? Yes, I didn't go into details on the, all the type of... Uh, um of penalties that are foreseen, but that is among the type of uh, sanctions uh, that are foreseen. Uh, there are, of course, fines, financial sanctions for those in breach. But of course, it goes beyond the, the relevant article to mention confiscation and and, uh, and other measures or of confiscation of the goods. Yes. I also have another other few elements of clarification, but perhaps we can come to you. Yeah. If you want. Let's, let's bring in Tessa, and, and then we can come back. I'll come back to you um, for clarification after Tessa. But thanks very much for now, Tessa. Thanks for your patience. Um, what are the potential implications then of the regulation for the coffee sector? We've heard about palm oil from Olivier, and in particular, I'm interested to hear from you. How do you think that we can avoid the most vulnerable uh, being mm -hmm. impacted by it, Tessa? Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for this. And um, I must say, it's it's really interesting to to listen to Olivier as well to see kind of what the implications are and how uh, Muslim Mas in this case is moving on that. And um, there's definitely some things that I I do recognize from the the coffee sector as well. Um, I also think that's where the potential risk and a lot of the potential solutions lie. Um, so maybe to sketch a little bit of context of what the coffee sector looks like, um, because I assume not everyone in this uh, in this webinar is aware of that. Um, but we're talking about a sector that is highly dependent on smallholders. Um, we're talking about 12 and a half million smallholder farms um, times two or three. Then you have the number of farmers. Um, and not only are we talking about a lot of smallholders, but we're also talking about a lot of origins. So coffee is being grown across the coffee belt, which spans over 50 countries. So mind you, um, the requirements to be compliant with local legislation times 50 uh, for at least a number of global com uh, companies. So that's good to be aware of. Um, and on top of that, those origins are not similar. There's a large diversity of the type of origin and there's a large diversity of the farmers within origin. So that just to give you kind of a flavor of the complexity that the sector is dealing with. Having said that, I do believe that the legislation is a good thing. I do believe the goal of the legislation is a good thing. So that means that we need to think about how do we address this holistically, right? How can this be addressed um, within the spirit of the law, understanding and not downplaying any of the complexities um, that we've just heard. And a lot of that actually goes into doing things collectively. So there's a lot of benefit in, in addressing things collectively and addressing things between public and private sector. Um, and, and just to give you some examples of that um, that I've, I've witnessed in the coffee sector uh, in the last year, so one that, as IDH, we tend to reference a lot is the Vietnam case, um, where there is currently an EUDR action plan that is designed between the Vietnamese government and uh, the private sector covering the Central Highlands, which is the main coffee producing region of the country. Um, and what, what I really like about that example is that um, it is the collaboration 
to get a region to be compliant. So it's not just supply chain driven, but it's regionally driven. What that does is that um, it leads to efficiencies, but it also leads to um, an inclusive supply chain. So there is no more kind of the opportunity to pick and choose your lowest risk farmers to then be part of your supply chain, but you actually work on a collective uh, plan towards a whole region, which means that whatever is being sourced from that region is compliant. And you collectively then also work on not just compliance, but also mitigation. So thinking around if then you do find a farmer that has deforested, then what's the response? What do you do? What's the protocol? So it allows you to move away from um, a supply chain approach to regional approach, which leads to potentially larger inclusivity, at least uh, inclusion of your higher risk farmers, but then also a collective protocol of, of mitigation. Um, and I think that's really strong. In all openness, Vietnam, I would say, is probably ahead of most other origins that I've seen. And uh, a large part of that is the existing efficiency and the existing visibility within the supply chains in Vietnam compared to a number of other countries. Now, having said that, um, we also see similar kind of initiatives happening in other countries where the supply chains are more opaque. Um, none of those are to the level of maturity that the one in Vietnam is, but really I want to emphasize the opportunity that's there for collective action while understanding that there is this hard deadline, right? So, um, and that takes the form of, in some countries, it is uh, public-private, in other countries, it's different private sector parties coming together, but then saying, we are willing to offer whatever mapping data and traceability data we have to a government institution to then be complemented with whatever is out there from the government institution. Um, what is crucial is that that's being done thinking about kind of a, a time approach. So what is needed to be compliant now? What is needed to build that inclusivity that I was just talking about? And what is needed going forward to then uh, build your mitigation strategy, not only for EUDR, but also for the CSDDD that's on its way, for example. Um, so I really want to vouch that, yes, it's complex. We all understand that. We all know that. Yes, there is an absolute risk, and we see this happening, of exclusion of smallholders. Um, there is also a risk of um, inefficiency in your supply chains. Having to segregate your supply chains has a big impact. Going in collectively, even though it might take longer, and we understand you have to be compliant by the end of this year, or actually in many cases now, if you want to be able to import by the end of the year, the longer term perspective um, means that working together is probably still your best option, at least going forward. Um, so I really want to want to emphasize that. And um, I said, I think Vietnam is a really interesting case to look into. Thank you, Tessa. Um, is there a risk that EU markets will be sh significantly short of coffee next year? Will I, will, I get a cup, will I get a cappuccino when I visit Paris? Um, I would not think so, to be fair. I think the risk is more on the other side. I think um, there will be a number of origins that are significantly short of demand from the EU market. Um, so I think there will be a shift in where you source from, at least on the short term. Um, and there, as mentioned, there are origins where um, the supply chains are clearer. The number of smallholders is smaller. The risk on deforestation is lower. You will see that from those origins, much more will enter the European market, at least on the short term. That, however, on the long term is not a good thing necessarily for the coffee sector overall, because that also means that probably most of the investments will go to those origins, while the actual diversity of origins allows the sector for now to have the range of flavor profiles that's out there um, to be more resistant against weather events that we've seen over the last years. So for the overall resilience of the sector, it's not a good thing if all investments go to two or three origins. Um, so there is, there's a larger bit at stake there as well. 
next to, mind you, all the smart holders within those origins, of course. Okay, thanks very much. Great point that. Um, and but thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm enjoying watching the race to the top on the Q and A uh, uh, Q and A box. Uh, Benjamin French, looks like your question will be asked very shortly. Emmanuel, I wanted to go back to you. You had some further points of clarification you wanted to make, and I welcome any comments you have following up from Olivier and Tessa's uh, remarks. Thank you, Jan, and, and thank you, Tessa and Olivier, because it's it's a, it's a very uh, rich debate. Just a few elements of of, uh, of rectification. Uh, first of all, the regulation will enter into force at the end of this year, so competent authorities will have to carry check, carry out check as of next year, not as of uh, as of uh, 2026. So, uh, the regulation is fully for uh, fully enforced and applicable as of next year, not as of uh, 2026. Secondly, on legality, uh, I would like to uh, shed some light. It doesn't mean that uh, each and every uh, small holder needs to uh, provide the proof of uh, the land title for, for its land. Uh, the, the, it's nowhere in the regulation. But we, we know that uh, the, uh, oftentimes there is uh, deforestation is associated with phenomenon of uh, a land grabbing. So, the, and, but this is boils down to a risk assessment. In some situations, this is highly more probable than, than in other in other locations. And th this is where it's the obligation of the operator to carry out to carry out due diligence to obtain information that uh, the, the product is actually legal. But it, it doesn't mean that each and every small holder has to provide the land title. So just to be crystal clear, date and time of production. Uh, date and time of production is not something that an operator has to provide when submitting the due diligence statement. It's part of, so it, it doesn't create uh, blockages when it comes to uh, submitting uh, due diligence statement or, or custom declaration for imported products. It is an information, however, that an operator have, has to have uh, as part of its due diligence uh, system. Um, one uh, last element uh, on segregation, because I, I think this is also an important topic. Uh, the thrust of the regulation is that if, if we were to um, allow uh, in the EU commodities or products from unknown origins, uh, we would not be able to achieve the objective that we are set out to achieve, meaning to be sure that we minimize EU contribution to deforestation. So. I fail to see how in the absence of uh, segregating uh, commodities of known origin from those of unknown origin, I fail to see how this objective could be realistically achieved. Um, but again, uh, th this is, uh, uh, this is a, a inevitable coro corollary of the objective that this regulation uh, aims to. Um, we can discuss then about uh, declaration in excess and, and, I, and, and overall, uh, I think it's, it, what is important to acknowledge is that uh, there are, indeed many initiatives that this regulation even before entering into application but uh, as set in motion uh, be it in vietnam or in other in other countries and i think both from the public sector and the private sector i think this witness to the fact that uh, in the absence uh, it, it is really necessary to work on the demand side of uh, given these these commodities because um, otherwise voluntary commitment or supply side measure, uh, they would have, a, it, 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 it's hard to gather a lot of traction merely on the basis of a voluntary commitment. And I think it's the evidence that despite voluntary commitment in the last few years, uh, deforestation has not altered nor uh, reversed. Um, maybe one last point on small holders, because I, I, I see there is a lot of emphasis in this webinar on small holders. Yeah, um, please. please. Uh, I, we, of course, we acknowledge that there is a, and there may be a challenge in some situations. Uh, however, I, I and, and of course, we mean many, many of these, uh, we have a number of stakeholders that we meet, including small holders, without uh, disavowing the fact that there, that there is a challenge and that there are a lot of initiatives ongoing, I think we also have, uh, receive a more nuanced picture insofar as uh, truly small holders in uh, in some situations at least acknowledge the importance of uh, 
to sum up transparency on the supply chain, because this is uh, shedding transparency would allow them to uh, to cut a lot of uh, middlemen, so to speak, and to have a more likely uh, a fairer income for their for their product. So to to have more uh, geolocation is uh, is a byword of transparency and transparency over the supply chain. I think would be ultimately to the benefit of of, uh, of smallholders, not always to their detriment. Okay, thanks, Manuel. Now let's turn to your questions. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, Benjamin French, you have won the uh, competition to be the first question asked, um, with more likes than anyone else. But thank you very much indeed. What I think I'll do here, a lot of these questions are really going to be for Emmanuel. Um, but what I, Olivier, Tessa, if you want to comment, just raise your hand and I'll bring you in um, after Emmanuel has answered. But inevitably, there are some questions that are aimed uh, most, most specifically at Emmanuel. Tessa, I will bring you in in a sec. I do want to get to our first question. Right, Benjamin French's question. Um, and he's been picked just at the end, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, does the EU Commission have a plan for approval of verification bodies that can provide the evidence for de 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 zero deforestation with methodology aligned to the EUDR policy? Emmanuel. The letter of the regulation is clear when it comes to certification and verification body. And it's, uh, as such, uh, there would not be any change in principle to what the to the role that certification uh, uh, played in the in the UTR. Uh, certification mechanism can um, provide a, a, a key role in the risk assessment of, of an operator. Uh, however, they have to uh, provide the information that an operator has to, uh, has to collect. So they can play a key role insofar as they uh, support the operator to uh, collect or to have the information that an operator has to provide, most typically geolocation. So there will not be any green lane for a certified product, uh, be them public or um, private certification. Of course, there may be uh, a repository of good practice, uh, etc. But any, there, there won't be any certification scheme that will dispense operators from their duty and obligation, due diligence obligations. Thank you. Um, I had forgotten about our poll. Um, perhaps could one of my colleagues just... Uh... Uh, present the results and we can look they can have them on screen as we and we can look at them as as we go um okay uh hopefully everyone can see them okay um uh catherine halley's question similar one to to benjamin's question how will the eu competent authorities align on their maps and assessment of deforestation so that the industry has some form of alignment on verif verification methods emmanuel do you want to comment specifically on maps this is something that olivier mentioned as well Sorry, what is the how are you going to align on your maps? How the mapping? Uh, Catherine's questions around how will you align on maps and assessment of deforestation so that there is alignment on the methods? Uh, look on on maps. Um, as you may know, we have a, a, a deforestation platform where we present a lot of uh, work on our on the different work strands leading up to the, the, the implementation of the regulation. One of these is the EU Observatory on Deforestation, which was presented uh, uh, last December and which was already online. Uh, the observatory will provide a forest cover map dated as uh, to the cutoff date. I forgot to mention that we are looking at deforestation occurred after 2020, after the end of 2020. And these maps, this forest cover map uh, will allow any operator or competent authority to answer to these very clear questions. Does this geolocation correspond to an area that used to be forest in 2020 as of the cutoff date? If the action is, if the answer is yes, of course, uh, uh, this will be a first step of, of, of risk assessment because it may well be that such commodity has been produced on a land that indeed has been subject to conversion from forest to agricultural use. But this, uh, it's important to uh, state that these maps from the observatory, EU Observatory on Deforestation, which is developed by our colleagues in, in the Joint Research Center, are these maps are neither mandatory, so there is no obligation to use these maps. They're not exclusive. 
because we are aware that in some countries there may be more granular, more precise, more detailed maps, uh, and they are no legally binding. So uh, it's just one tool that we make available to operators and, and, and competent authorities to inform their risk assessment. Thank you very much. Uh, poll, interesting interesting results in the poll. It's pleasing to see that um, uh, the uh, majority of um, our, everyone on the call, probably unsurprisingly, um, is at least in conversations about how to comply with EUD, EUDR or has taken created plans or taken actions, which is great. Um, and it's also interesting that um, there are definitely um, more, everybody agrees pretty much most people agree that um, it's the responsibility of business to ensure that smallholders can comply with the new, new legislation. Um, apologies that we'd strongly agree there twice. We weren't trying to skew the poll, um, but um, thanks very much for uh, for answering them. Um, Olivia, you want to come in? Well, I just want to avoid... Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. I just want to avoid things to get too cold. I, I wanted to thank Emmanuel for the clarification on the, the fact that there's no need for every small there to submit an untitled. That's definitely not the way I read the regulation or the way it seems to be understood at the moment. It seems to be that there's a requirement for to follow the law of the land. And if the land requires that uh, you have a land title, I'm, I don't know how this tallies with the fact that we have to be complied, that we have to comply. So I, there, there's a bit of, a, of an issue there, Evan Willey. But if you can put it in writing, in the FAQ or even in something better, I'm, I'll be very, very, very happy. And if I can know how many percent of the smallholders without land titles can be accepted, I'll be twice as happy. So thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks, Olivier. Tessa, very quickly. Yeah, not necessarily on the land titling, but uh, in, in agreement to, to warm the discussion a bit. Um, I just wanted to say that the point that Emmanuel was making around the increased transparency within the supply chain and the importance of that, I can only second that. That is going to be very important um, and make a difference, not just on deforestation as this regulation is, is working towards, but definitely has the potential to make a difference on a lot of other issues that we've uh, been facing in at least the coffee sector, but uh, I know other sectors as well for a long time. So really want a second uh, that we should not underestimate the importance of that, that bit. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Um, next question from uh, our audience, um, Penelope Chuse, or Chusat's question. Um, she asks, how far does regulation look into supply chains? And she gives an example. Would beef from a zone of the EU that has not been deforested, but has been fed with soy from a potentially deforested area in South America be considered compliant or not? Emmanuel. Emmanuel, you're on mute, I'm afraid. Sorry. If, um, if soy is imported uh, um, into the EU uh, at import, any uh, the informa information about the deforestation-free nature of such soy uh, would have to be provided. So um, any uh, farmer in the EU will have to uh, have that information, of course. And I guess that uh, going forwards, the soy would not necessarily, or the derived product would not get into the EU if there was a risk of deforestation. Precisely. But presumably if there is pre-2024 uh, um, derived products, then that would be within scope. Pre-2024? Well, so if, 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 if I'm a farmer if, and I buy an old lot of stuff this year, I can use it next yeah. year. Yeah, of course. Because yeah. at the moment, uh, the the, um, the commodity has entered into the market, uh, it didn't need to comply with the obligation of, uh, of having a um, geolocation requirement, of, of, of being accompanied with by uh, geolocation information. Okay, and we have a follow-up question about compound feed. Is compound feed included in the uh, scope of the regulation? I guess it will be. Uh, um, derived product, yes. I'm I'm not sure I know exact. I mean, the list of 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 derived product is in Annex One, so I'm, I okay. don't know it by heart. But one may check whether this corresponds to an HS code in Annex One. Okay, um, we're going to 
question um, from Tobias Zobel, uh, specifically around uh, aligning data sharing with the Indonesian and Malaysian government. Um, what are you doing to align uh, data sharing with them, Emmanuel? And perhaps Olivia, you could comment on this as well. Well, on on these, uh, of course, we we this regulation is one part of the of the of the jigsaw. So it's not in itself the only tool, and we. Of course, we acknowledge that it has to accompany, and the regulation itself acknowledge the need to work and step up cooperation with uh, with third countries. This is what we are doing. We are doing that also with Indonesia and Malaysia, specific for a number of issues uh, and for a number of, uh, uh, of of topics, including this one on, on on the data sharing. We are discussing. This is one of the topics uh, of these uh, of the task force we are currently entertaining with Malaysia and, and, and Indonesia, uh, alongside with other uh, topics, of course, including uh, the smallholders. But the, the, this is an issue that we are currently discussing uh, with the authorities there. Thank you. Uh, Olivia, do you want to comment, given Muslim Mass, of course, significant operations in, in uh, that part of the world? Oh, well, I, I think it's uh, the, the question and the answer are, are speaking a, a bit for themselves. Yes, there's a lot of need for the uh, for collaboration, for better collaboration with uh, with uh, the production product producing countries, and definitely Indonesia, Malaysia for palm. I think. Look, I, I'm sorry, I'm the bad guy tonight, but uh, I will say that one of the biggest disappointments, if I can speak from an Indonesian perspective, I mean, I've been here long enough, maybe I can claim a little bit of, uh, of Indonesian uh, perspective. One of the biggest disappointments was on the scrapping of the UDR, of the UTR, because if there was one country where it had been working, it was Indonesia. So it was a good place on which to build in. And the, the, the preparatory documents for the UDR specifically say that it worked in Indonesia, but because it only worked in Indonesia, we're going to scrap it altogether. I think that there's, there was a bit, a bit of a missed opportunity there. And there's today still a feeling that we could have built on it, use some of the tools it had created, be a bit more inventive. I and mean, nobody is against the UDR in as much as what it wants to achieve, rather the opposite. But we could have been, I go back to what I said during my little intro, which was, come on, the EU should have known better. There's been a lot of work done already by the industries, by the countries, even between the EU and certain producing countries. We could have started from a slightly different point. So that, that's all I'll say. But like I say, sorry, tonight I'm, I'm apparently the, the, the bad fellow. So that's all right. Olivier, thank you. Um, okay, quick question now, um, Manuel. I, what's the threshold at which events are considered deforestation under the regulation? Our questioner, Frederick, asks, is deforestation of less than half a hectare, for example, classified as deforestation event? Or, or is there a threshold? And how is it, how is it defined, Emmanuel? Uh, I will have uh, then <laughs> to be an, <laughs> to play the if you allow me the the bad guy on the other side because uh, I would need to rectify a bit what Olivier has said insofar as yes the UTR has been replaced but the flagged regulation has not been replaced so the the uh, the, the, the flagged regulation which is the the I mean the, the, you know there was a uh, certification schemes for timber and and this will not be replaced. So uh, timber coming from Indonesia uh, accompanied by a flag certificate will continue to be to enter the European Union market. And so in that regard, I think that tool will remain in force and will, will not change. Um, there were other considerations uh, that led to the replacing of the UTR, but simply the fact that it was not possible to have uh, a number of bilateral, uh, uh, to multiply by seven and by number of, uh, of countries worldwide, the, the, the voluntary partnership agreements and the flag, uh, uh, flag license, let alone the fact that out of the major timber producing countries, only Indonesia uh, proved to be interested and to uh, actually uh, move to the certification phase. On the other question, I think, um, uh, well, the, the, we using the, the, the definition of deforestation is uh, the one that is, uh, we on, on the definition of deforestation, but also the other definition of what is forest or what is, uh, um, I mean, there are a number of deforestation on which we, of, a number of definitions on which we have relied uh, on, on FAO definitions including the one on deforestation and the one on forest, uh, which uh, 
uh, of course, if 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 there is then a forest, uh, in, in the forest is defined exactly as uh, in in Article Two, as long as a, a, a forest is, uh, I would say. Uh, concerned uh, it doesn't matter the amount of deforestation within that forest uh, otherwise one could could gradually deforest a smaller amount of less than half an hectare and and this would not be uh, this would not amount as deforestation so as long as there is a forest and it's defined as land spanning more than 0 0.5 hectares any um, encroaching on that forest uh, would qualify as deforestation insofar as it qualifies as conversion to from that forest into agricultural use huh? we are not looking at other types of conversions we are not looking at conversions into commodities other than those in scope okay but but if anyone wants more information they can go to the fao uh, definitions um olivia tessa you both want to come in please very briefly tessa yeah, I just quickly wanted to reflect on kind of the relationship between the different countries and building on what's already there, right? Um, I do think there there's some important uh, things to consider, um, and this is definitely something that plays a lot in the coffee sector as well. So um, I would say there, there are a few things. So one is what's the role of, of the EU and the EU delegations in country, but then also what's, for example, the role of the International Coffee Organization representing basically all governments from coffee producing countries. And I feel there can be more, more discussion, more conversation and more tangible outcomes. I feel there's a lot of unclarity right now on who picks up what role. And to go back to the initial point of how do you collaborate, I think also there, it shouldn't be a matter of public sector and private sector within country only, but also what's the overall um, commitment that we make to this. And um, for me, the same would go actually for private sector, right? So we do see a move of origins where uh, coffee is being sourced from. We do see already uh, contracts in Ethiopia not materializing just because of the risk that there won't be compliance. However, what's the sector commitment to a diversified sector and therefore to investing in those origins as well? So I do want to put in a quick call out that, yes, there is a lot that we can build on. Uh, and yes, I do believe there can be more action towards that common vision and that common sharing because we're all benefiting from a stronger sector and from deforestation free supply chains. So I think I really want to put that frame in and not forget that, yes, in all the complexity, there is a larger vision that we need to uh, follow. Thank you, Tessa. Olivier, do come in, but just very briefly, because I do want to get... Very briefly. Yes, very briefly on the EUTR. Again, I would like to thank Emanuele for his uh, interpretation of the regulation, but I think the regulation itself is very clear. EUTR is being phased out. Yes, and it's only kept for a temporary phase. So you cannot say that it's going to be kept. It will be kept only for a temporary period of time. And I think we have to be honest on that. Uh, I don't, again, I don't see that as a problem, but we just cannot say that it will remain. It will remain for a very brief period of time. And the preparatory documents of the EUDR say clearly that it will not be used. And it will, and again, and that one I would echo what Tessa said. There is, there, there was, I think, and there still is, hopefully, some room for a bit broader engagement and some uh, common sense to bring back uh, into the, uh, the EUDR implementation and make it so that. It's an opportunity for change and not just the creation of a niche market. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a very specific question, uh, Manuel. I'm sorry, back to you. Um, question about in Ivory Coast and Ghana, cocoa companies are not allowed to have contractual relations with farmers. So how can they assure their suppliers will be complying um, uh, with this, uh, with the EUDR? Emmanuel. Can, can you repeat the question, Jan? In Ivory Coast and Ghana, cocoa companies are not allowed to have contractual relations with farmers. How, in that case, can they ensure compliance with EDR? Well, I, I'm I'm not aware about this specific uh, uh, situation, so I'm, I'm I will investigate if uh, if there is more information about this. I would be happy to, but I'm, honestly, I'm not in a position to to answer to this. 
conversely, okay. sorry, Olivier, but I, I need to um, clarify facts and uh, far from me to sure. entertain a ping pong on w, um, w, WP, VPA or to be clear, I didn't say that UTR will not be repealed. UTR will be replaced and repealed and replaced, clear. What I said is that flagged regulation will continue to be in force. So timber licensed by Indonesia will continue to uh, undergo the, uh, the rules of flagged regulation, not UTR. UTR, repeal and replace. I didn't say that. I say that flagged will continue to be in force. Of course, flagged regulation and licensed timber can only be approved of legality and not of deforestation free. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Right, um, time for one final question um, uh, before we wrap up. Uh, it's a question about um, support. What is the European Union, Union doing to uh, support uh, producers from developing countries to comply with the EUDR? So Emmanuel, very quickly, what are you doing specifically to help these sort of producers that we've been talking about? It's very difficult to, in a succinct way to provide an outline of what we are doing uh, from Team Europe initiatives to um, project uh, worldwide from a traceability uh, project for soy in, in Argentina to uh, um, geolocation, inventory of geolocations for rubber in Thailand, uh, uh, cocoa and coffee, of course, also in African countries, uh, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and of course, entertaining dialogue with uh, producing countries and the public sector. What we can, I mean, there is a panoply of uh, tools, cooperation programs, dialogue, but oftentimes what we see mm -hmm. is that they do not necessarily always systematically need EU funding. Also, members, EU member states are um, very active on that front. The Team Europe Initiative is a joint endeavor of EU uh, and member states, uh, but oftentimes we see uh, countries rolling out uh, a traceability platform uh, with or without European Union support, but because this is a change induced, perhaps accelerated, it would have been there anyway. Uh, I would say that perhaps the regulation has accelerated the pace of a sustainability trend, a traceability trend that was already there. Uh, so. The activities and the programs are multiple and in multiple countries for multiple sectors. Okay, thank you. Right, um, we are coming towards the end. I'd like each of our panelists just to sum up and, and say what they are taking away from our conversations over the past hour. It's been a really fascinating conversation, as I knew it would be, and um, you had loads of interesting questions. So, um, Tessa, why don't you start us? What, what you, just again, briefly, what are you taking away from this conversation? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um... Well, I think the first thing there, there's still a lot of questions, still a lot of unclarity. Um, I do hope, and I, I think we did bring some perspective to the discussion um, and really want to end with there. It brings a lot of opportunities as well, as long as we can look beyond the compliance and think around uh, the larger uh, context. So um, lots will need to be clarified, but definitely, plenty of opportunity to do this well if we take the right action now. Thank you, Tessa. Olivier, just briefly, briefly, please. Thanks, Wally. Going a bit to uh, what Tessa said, I do believe uh, there, there are a few opportunities there. I'm worried of the fact that this time the Brussels effect might not take place and that uh, we, again, we're going to end up with a niche rather than end up with, uh, with a broad change. And that's what I'm worried about. And most important, I think that was the theme for tonight. What worries me is that some smallholders will be definitely put at a disadvantage and actually excluded from EU supply chain. While the industries that, uh, that uh, to which they are linked were progressing and had devised ways which were quite practical to deal with, uh, to keep them included and keep them progressing. Thanks. Thanks, Olivier. And Emmanuel, final thoughts? No, thank you, first of all, for, for, for the opportunity. I, I would echo what, the, what, the, what has been said that the, the, the the work ahead uh, is still significant. We are aware that there are a number of practical aspects of implementation that are uh, that needs to be dispelled. We also aware that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, narratives that need to be rectified uh, and we need to dispel ambiguities or factually inaccuracies in some cases. Uh, but I think I would end up in, on a more positive, uh, I think it's important to 
end up on, on, a, on a positive note that indeed uh, uh, this regulation provides a lot of opportunities also for uh, uptake of traceability tools, more transparent supply chains. Uh, some had already put this in place earlier on. A lot is still need to be done, but uh, and the time is 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 short. But we are confident that this will uh, prove result by the in 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 time, not by the end of the year, but uh, but in time. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Okay, we're going to have to draw things to a close. Uh, my thanks to our panel, and just for just in case there's any doubt, Olivier Emmanuel, you are both the good guys. Okay, there's no bad there are no bad guys on on the panel for sure. Um, thanks very much to you all for your questions. Um, we had 250 of them. We'll do our very best to share them with everybody. Um, I think there's loads of insights there uh, that is worth sharing. So we'll do our very best to, to share them with you all. Um, if you're keen to continue the conversations around the impacts of uh, EUDR with our audience or need indeed need help engaging your own supply chain stakeholders to uh, find a way through it all, to get in touch with our stakeholder engagement and communications team. We convene these kind of conversations to generate actionable outcomes. My colleague Tanya Rishar, Innovation Forum's Head of Stakeholder Engagements, her uh, email address is on the uh, on the slide right there. Full these details of our event series is also available on the Innovation Forum website. We'll be covering the ongoing implications of uh, the EU's deforestation regulation at our future food events in the coming months and at this year's Sustainable Commodities and Landscapes event in October. Uh, we'll be back in touch with everybody in the next few days because we'll be sharing the audio and video recordings of this webinar so you can watch again if you wish to or share it uh, with your colleagues. For now, I hope you found this webinar useful. I really enjoyed bringing it to you. I've been Ian Welsh. Thanks very much indeed uh, for joining us and goodbye.